yeah, when when you do an interview with Wavis, you've just gotta you've gotta wait you've gotta wait till he starts. This is an interview for Peep Magazine where I joined with the UK's first surrealist alternative comedian. The man, the man, the, the myth, thing. Wavis or Shave. Um, I've got, is I've it? got two, two things to tell you at the very start, right? Uh huh. Hello. I've got, um, in case I get short, uh -huh. that's me, we, that's me, me. me Oh, blue. Now it's nicely chaos today. Oh, well, this you... Me, this is me wee bucket in case I get caught short. Oh, right, right got you. I can hear yeah, rain well, in, the, in, in the background uh, as well. Uh, where it says, is, is it raining there? It might be, yeah. You know, yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's no chance the hard's turn it up because... People reckon he's had some hard attacks, but that's a, ch a hard Chinese whisper. He actually hasn't been paying his hard attacks... Oh, to wow. uh, HMRC, which is Hard Men's Ready Cash, and he's in the nick, so there's no way oh. he's turning up to the other. Uh, we don't want that clock, do we? That's yeah. an absolute shame because I, I was hoping that uh, I was no, hoping the Hard would make a bit of an appearance, you know. He's in the nick. <laughs> he's in the nick. He's too hard. Well, uh, Dad, please, he's not coming. To be honest with you, I'm absolutely <laughs> terrified. He caused a fight in a lift. Uh, an empty I did. Room. You know, you don't want to be in a lift with him, but an empty room he causes fight. Anyway, so, I did. Uh, I did watch a part of uh, the tube, and uh, it was a part that I hadn't seen when the, when the hard come bursting through a reception, and uh, yeah. and instead of ringing the bell, you put your foot on hey, the. Where did you find that? I seen it last night. Yeah. Don't lose it. That's the very last. Uh, the last episode. Don't lose that, right? Because I've seen it for years and my missus is in it, right? Don't ever lose that. Oh, right, right. And then, on that one. And, hey, then and then you put your foot on the on the um the bell. It, it was a vintage Chinese bell it had for years, right? I oh, busted wow. it. He put his pit boot on, he stood on it, busted it. And then you know? and then she called him uh, what she wouldn't get away with now, but then she called him a skinny puff. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't get away with that stuff now. <laughs> Don't lose that clip. I've been waiting to see for about thirty-five years. Oh right, I, yeah, yeah. I just, I wonder if it's just been put up because. Uh... Yeah, might have been. It's the fortieth anniversary today. I say I'm in, I'm in the New Con uh, Newcastle Chronicle. I did an interview for them. Yeah. That's right, the, right, uh, cool. But we, we wasn't going to talk about the heart, um, the two, too much because no. we did it. Of course. But I am going to get Phil the Gap to talk about something regarding the tube uh, very, very shortly, yeah? Something else I didn't mention. I've got a bad dose of um, nose Tourette's at the minute. Oh, yeah? right. Got you. You'll have to excuse me. You see what I mean? Yeah, saying? yeah. I get that. I get that. Punk! Um, I'll do a kind of choice. I can't do anything about it. Um, Snack! It's really bad at the minute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, may, maybe we could start with this with um a couple of things just to touch on the tube, um maybe a couple of things that we we either didn't talk about or were were kind of missed. Yeah. Go because on, for the people who don't know, we've already done an in, an interview about was about two year ago now. Two years ago. Two 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 year ago. Um, How hard are you? <laughs> I know. And um, what it was is uh, where there's a couple of Snapped. like there was a couple of um little gems that are, are kind of that got past us, which were pop popular for doing the celebrity ambushes, but well, well, now, and, you know, I did that outside of the tube, right? I did yeah. Spare time. I'm the master of celebrity ambushes. Um, recently, I I thought wouldn't it be funny if I stalked. The world's heavyweight boxing champion. I mean, who stalks world heavyweight boxing right. champion? Right. Right. Cut this one short. It's that Tyson Fairy fella, yeah? Um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
So I, I hung around for three hours ago. I knew he had to come in this, this thing and he came in his car. And I had a poster of the hard. I thought it'd be really funny if he signed a poster of the hard, you know. If I was just sign this and he signed it, it was a hard. Yeah. But when he got out of the car and I was asking him, you know, he, he just looking, he's a big bloke. He's, he's quite tall, yeah. This gorilla's got out and said, he just doesn't sign anything. And then, you know, uh-huh. I was, I was looking, ste- we was doing a bit of Mr. Stereo up there, right? I don't know. And then uh-huh. he went in the building to sign things for his VIPs who paid £328 a ticket to get them signed. Right? Oh, right. Anyway, I, I thought it was hilarious stalking the, the world's heavyweight boxing champ. It was just so funny. But celebs, in, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I did that in my own spare time. I've got um, Ricky Gervais, Ricky John Gervais. Lydon, Harry Hill. John um, Lydon. Yeah, John Lydon. Prince Charles, oh, King Charles, I met the king, you know. Wow, stalked the king. I'll go through them quickly, right? Uh, yeah. Of it, can you remember a movie called The King of Comedy with Robert De Niro? And Jimmy love, Lewis? love the film. Di- directed by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I always wanted to reenact a scene from the movie, right? Right. I like to reenact things that I've seen that have amused me. I'll digress slightly. Arthur Daly... Minder. From the Minder, yeah. He did want people to see him, right? He'd walk past like this, didn't he? Uh-huh. <laughs> Which is ridiculous, because it draws more attention to yourself. <laughs> I actually did that one, a fellow in a hotel who was desperate to meet me, and I stayed out of his way. Then we came down in the foyer in the morning, and, and, and I saw him, and I thought, oh, no, and I had to walk past him. So, <laughs> and it worked, you know? Anyway, uh, Ricky Gervais was, at the time, they were saying, oh, the king of comedy. So I thought, right, great chance to reenact the scene. Okay, mm. it was a long time ago. It was a leap year, I remember. I did all my homework like I normally do. Yeah. And I waited till he came out. He came out the fire exit, actually, and the car was ready for him to get in and was off. So, if you remember, in the movie, um, Rupert Pupkin and, and Jerry Lewis. So I'm shouting, I'm actually shouting, Jerry, Jerry, to Ricky Gervais, because I'm now Rupert Pupkin. Yeah. Oh, Jerry, Jerry. And I went through exactly how they did in the movie. I had some of my work and I said, oh, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it in the business, Jerry. Um, can you take this with me and get back to me and let me know what you think? And he's going, yeah, 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 I don't want this business, you know. As he's walking get, down the street. That, uh, I had to, no, I had to get to sign an autograph to keep him there. Right. Oh, yes, when I get back to you. And of course, just like in the movie, he never did, oh. but I reenacted that scene. I wish I kidnapped him as, as well, like they did in the movie. You should have kid- yeah, yeah, you should have kid- kidnapped John him Ryder. with an apprentice, a female apprentice. Well, the missus was there. <laughs> well, you see it. Yeah. <laughs> she was there. Um, John <laughs> Ryder, I met him twice. I met him last year. That was a different meeting. That was like, not where met him. That was another me met John. And we oh, had a very, right. very emotional evening. Private one to one, it was lovely. Not talking about that one. The one I'm talking about is when Weavis met. And he was doing a show, it was about 2016, public image. Got you. And I waited, I waited till the encore. And I threw a tub of butter at him. Because mm. you remember the butter adverts? Butter oh, butter. He, yeah, he done the butter adverts. Really like, Everybody sees sold out, you know, he's doing bloody butter adverts. Yeah. Folks, he's, he's taking the money. So I threw. Um, caught a butter and it dropped right next to him and he, he's like he stopped and he said uh, is this meant to be a witticism is this what this country's coming to and we did a Mr. Stare out like this you know <laughs> uh, so anyway I was surprised I didn't get turfed out for that right but after the show um, when he left he went to his uh, his coach and he was having a curry and I had, I had a pre-prepared letter for him and uh he wasn't going to see anybody because his voice was going. He had a bit of a cold and Rambo, his bodyguard, said, oh, you know, he saw some people the other night and they abused him. So he weren't too keen on it, you know, the spat or whatever. So Rambo says, you can't see him. He'd... But anyway, I pushed me away in the coach and there he was sitting there in his dressing gown with a curry. I said, John, save your voice, keep your voice. Here's a letter for you. Just read the letter then and I'll settle for that. Ta-da! And I'm off because that's my style. And the letter explained how he got my job, you know, I should have been Johnny Rotten. I would have been Johnny Worser, and I could have spat further than him on a windy day. So that was my uh, my John Lydon one. You're right. Uh, oh, but Harry, Harry Hill was just the other week, actually. Wow. Uh, I, it's been you know Harry Hill, the Harry Hill, you know, surreal. 
what well, well, she probably took a bit of homage from from from, from you back in the day, I, I should imagine. Well, I did He's... well to catch him. I did well to catch him. It, the circumstance, I, I did my homework really well and know how to do this, you know. And it, it's always private one-to-one and it really surprises these people. Anyway, long story short, I caught him and um, I said, uh, because of the COVID business, I didn't think we could get very close. I said, hey, Harry, can we just have a little chat for a distance, like, you know. Uh, yeah. And I said, uh, David Quantic has sent me to meet you, which isn't true. It wasn't true. David Quantic's a scriptwriter. Yeah. All right, got you. And 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 I said to David Quantic, who was a friend of mine, I said, I'm going to tell him that you sent me to, to, to meet you, you know, so it might keep him still. So he didn't know who the hell I was. And I said, I'll oh, fetch you some fig rolls, Harry, yeah, you know, can you take them? Yeah, he put them in his pocket. And I said, uh, I said, Danny Baker, I was really into name dropping at this point. I got said, you. Danny, Danny, you know me, mate. I said, he, he told me the time. He was telling me about the time that you, you met Spike Milligan. Uh, you know, you were a big fan and you wanted to meet Spike and there was this function and you had the opportunity to go and meet him. So you went over there all humble and everything. said, oh, Spike, you know, I'm a great fan. Uh, I've always wanted to meet you. And Spike says, well, you have now. Fuck off. All right. Now, that's, that's what Danny Tobita told me. But Harry wasn't having it. He said, no, no, no. He, he, he told me to go. Uh, so oh. I don't know who to bloody believe here. Right. right. I don't know who to believe. Okay. And, uh, and, yeah. and, and, then, and then I said, um, my mate Gary Bushell, you know, name dropping, I said, TV pundit. I said, uh, I'll just tell you what he said publicly once, Harry. He said that Wave Us All Shave was Harry Hill before Harry Hill was Harry, Harry Hill. Hill. Yeah. yeah. And he's kind of, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, uh, I gave him uh, my website, which he was going to take a look at and all this business. And um, we had a handshake. I, I congratulated him on, on being pretty good at being Harry Hill, even though I'd been Harry Hill first. Uh-huh. And I let the man go. So he was pretty calm throughout, although my missus reckon he might have been shitting himself. Cause right. I said, go and read the website I've give you, then you'll know who it is you've just met. Yeah. yeah. So that was a Harry Hill one. Uh, oh, it, um, I, I get the impression he's... He's like a bit boring off 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 screen. Well, listen, some of the fun, some of the funniest comedians who I won't name in real real life mm. are so boring. Mm-hmm. You know, when yeah. you're a funny person, you can't switch it off. You're a funny person all the time. You find them in every major city: Manchester, Glasgow, Liverpool, everywhere. Funny mm-hmm. people, uh, but they don't end up TV celebrities, and probably don't want to be. That's me. I never wanted to be one. You know, I could easily have been one. Yeah, of course, of course. I'm quickly going to show you this, so I can squeeze it in. This is um, international um, bestseller author Graham Hancock, right? Mm -hmm. And he got in touch with me some years back and he said, uh, can I have your permission to use your surname for the name of the hero tribe in my new novel? He wanted wanted me to give him permission to spear jig. So I thought... Hmm, I can imagine that when this gets made into a movie, uh-huh. and I'm in the cinema eating my popcorn, and the hero tribe, the spear jig, come on. Yeah, the spear So I gave him permission, uh-huh. and he actually, I don't know if you can see it, I'm going to cover a little bit up. Yeah. Oh, wow. You might be able to see that, but I just, yeah. So Thank, yeah, yeah. Got international bestseller author asked me for my permission that he could name his hero tribe in his first novel, the spear jig. How about that? It's absolutely amazing, mate. It is. It's absolutely kind of brilliant. The um, I, I, I quickly um. The se- there seems to be like um a, a resurgence since um we spoke about two years ago. Do you feel that that's it's like yeah, you, there is people you, contact me. Your career's kind of took yeah, leaps and bounds it's a again. Yeah, generation thing. Yeah, it's surprised surprising how many of the old people are still in and I'd have to say fans I always find it difficult to refer to them as fans you know fans yeah fandom fanable uh, snout yeah Um, uh, so yeah there is quite an increased interest in. yeah definitely I was going to quickly tell you Frida Ling's dad Abba the dark haired one yeah yeah I've 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 actually got a little fact about Frida I think I think it's a fact you shouldn't really say I think it's a fact should you no, carry on. <laughs> um, apparently, her father 
was it's an, true. an SS officer in the German army. Ah, no, that was... Um, she wanted to keep her quiet. It's good, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, Frida, yeah. in 1992, I wrote a script. And um, I really, for a, kind of like a serious movie, and I wanted it made, yeah? Because I can do these things. I actually can. I get bored. It's amazing what me and my wife can get up to. And we wrote this script. And we approached uh, a thing called the European Script Fund, which they really, really will help you get your movie off the ground. They really will help you. Yeah. But in the first instance, to prove that you're, um, you know, genuine, not a time waster, they need eight thousand quid off you to set the ball rolling. This was right. 1992. I had about eight quid. Right. So I thought, Wait, what, what am I going to do to, to get borrow eight hundred quid? Eight thousand. Eight thousand quid. Quid. Yeah. I said, well, you do the obvious thing. What anybody would do, you'd ask Frida from Abba for it, wouldn't you? Yeah. That's obviously. that's what I would do. Yeah. So, cutting a long story short, I thought, how do I get in touch with her? I got my ABBA albums out, and it said, recorded at Polar Studios. So, that was, I got in touch with them in Sweden. They said, right, okay, nice letter back. Here's our agent. Um, get in touch with him, which I did. I said, um, can you pass this on to Frida? Uh, and he did. And a, a while went by, I get a reply from her, okay, saying, send the script. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, because I always had a bit of a soft spot for Frida, actually. In fact, I'll tell you now, it might not have been Anna Ford's bum. It might have been Anna Fritz's bum. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so I thought, wow, you know, she might be going to give you the money. And I, I traded uh, something else through the agent. It was taking too long, I thought. Now I want to cut the middleman out, man. I want to cut him out. So um, I wrote to the Swedish embassy in London. I said... Can you give me Frida Lingstad's home address? All right. About a week later, I get a reply from the Swedish embassy in Manchester, giving me her home address. Wow. All right in Switzerland, so that I could deal with her personally. So we're trading letters like that. Personal letters from Frida's worth about two hundred and fifty quid on eBay. But anyway, I had a written book, you know. Oh, you yeah, you were writing about too happy about. Yeah. And then, you know, um, so anyway, I sent her the script. And now, the script was really about um, having a go at the Germans. It was historical. It wasn't a comedy. It was serious. And it was ah, serious. you see, so what I said there could have been... It was having a bash at the Germans. Now, I didn't know at the time she'd gone and married a German prince. And, uh, I'm finished, I'm finished. I've been fucking on here. I've had two stings already. So you better get a bloody move on or I'm chopping the electricity out. Um, what the anyway so um, Frida um, I sent her the script and it was having a go at the Germans she, she married a German prince so, so I came back she oh. sent it back she said oh I'm a bit, it's a bit stressed it, and I'm afraid I can't do this that was a massive massive mistake on my behalf seriously mm. but anyway the thing is I had all these letters from Frida and I thought now She's, she's licked these stamps here, hasn't she, to put them on the envelope, and it's got her DNA on it, hasn't it? It's oh, ours, yes. it's got saliva. So I peeled them up, I thought, right, you know, and I slept with them because it's got her DNA on it. Got so you. technically speaking, I've slept with Frieda Linkstad of Abba, haven't I? Yeah? Well, I have. Uh, yeah, you have, well, you have, man. But unfortunately... You uh, lucky bugger! A spoiler came along once and said, oh, no, she'll have had a butler and he'll have licked them. No, no, no. No, definitely not. All right, carry on, carry on. I'm going to let Mr. Whale in in a minute because we, we, we could have quickly talked about the Jew and move on. Yeah, um... I want, I want, I want Phil to mention to you from his own account, um, I, I was shooting on location for the tube and I invited him to come along. Mm -hmm. Um... It was during the minor strike, you know, and I thought it might be nice, you know, something to take your mind off things. So he came with me uh, while we were filming on location from the tube. Now, I want him oh, to yeah. take over and tell you now what happened. Go ahead. Take the stage. Take the stage, man. Go on. Fill the gap. Fill the gap. Ready. You recently rolled. I'll just take a little quick step backwards. Just that, oh, yeah. At the time, I was uh, striking the minor. Uh, somebody who was active in the strike uh, and believed in it but obviously things weren't going our way we had a lot of hardship at the time and uh, 
Wavis asked us if I'd like to come with him, accompany him to uh, his, his shoot. He was basically doing some filming for that for um, the tube at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was uh, it was being held in a local park. <laughs> Sorry, but I'll carry on, Phil. Right, need bother, man. So, yeah, local park, South Shields. And I thought, you know, why not? You know, it's something I'd, I'd love to. I've never been involved in anything like that. Actually, I thought, wow, this is going to be it's going to be a privilege. This great, great. So, hey, I turned up on the day and uh, we, were, we were met by, um, obviously, the, the, the crew. Mm -hmm. the and whatever. Oh. <laughs> Was it was this down at the at the uh, Tang Tees Studios as well? No, no, this was in a public park. All oh, right, we we're doing the actual shooting in the public park exhibition and, park. Uh, sorry, was it uh, was it exhibition park? No, um, South Marine Park. All oh, right, got you, got you. It, it, it's right on the coast. Obviously, it's the one with the big lake and the little. Um, the old uh, children's locomotive that goes, the, you know, around uh -huh. the park and whatever. Uh -huh. yeah, it, was, it just turned out to be a massive experience for me. I mean, obviously knowing Wavis the way I do, I've known him for a long time. Uh, oh. I'm thinking, oh, I, yeah, I, I, what's he going to get up to today? That's well, we were actually met by, a, a, obviously, a group of young know, middle-class um, people, the camera crew. Crew dressed in barber jackets, whatever. Yeah, and, you know, and I, I mean, to be fair, you could, you, you could see, even see then there were quite it was a bit of hero worshiping going on. Uh -huh. You know, the um, um, the yeah, from obviously by from the from the the uh, the film crew, but uh, that quickly abated a little bit when they realised that he wasn't at the time that the hard was uh, was riding high. You know. Um, with the public because of his appearances on the tube, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you know, I, I know that, that well. Yeah, it was it was obvious that the film crew, well, I had this thing about the hard and thought he was, you know, the bee's knees, mm -hmm. which of course he was. Um, but Wavis Wavis turned up on the day and basically told them that no, you know, I'm, I'm not here to do the hard the day, and you could see they were very very disappointed. And uh, he had turned around and he had says no, no, he says. Uh, I'm wanting to launch some new characters today. Um, oh. There you go. And I mean, I mean, what happened from there on that day? I, I just don't think that they, you know, that they were ready for this. To be honest with you, they weren't. Uh, you know, yeah, they weren't ready for the the alternativeness of Wave or Shave. Apparently, no, no, yeah, in the new character, yeah, in in the form of his new characters. You see. And I thought, oh, here we go, you know. I mean, with me, I'm sitting here looking at this, and I'm, I'm taking a some of it, but a little bit stressed myself, because you, you could feel the tension, uh -huh. you know. He introduced these new characters, one who was Mr. Stereoot. Basically, I was, uh, you know, basically all he did was stare people out there in <laughs> such a fashion that, you know, you do the hard proud, you know. Um, and the other guy was a guy called Mr. Ordinary Powder, um, who, mm -hmm. I mean, that was basically Wavis dressed in a what looked like a loincloth come nappy, walking around with a, um, a shopping basket under his arm, with a you know, containing a talking loaf, talking loaf of bread. Got you. Um, you know, and you know, a couple of catchphrases with regard to that. You know, one of them I think was do you, do you sell bread, and I know where that comes from. But the main one was he, he done this uh, what's known as a non sweary puppet show at the time. Uh huh. And it basically it involved him getting Wavis coming from behind the wall with these hand puppets. These hand puppets were talking Jordy, but they were actually foul mouthed hand puppets. <laughs> you know, and the, the crap was just all sexually based and. Uh, and obviously by then there was a crowd of the public were gathered by had gathered round by then. Mm -hmm. And all you could hear was all the expletives, you know, the F's and the B's and you know mm -hmm. and you, the, you could just see the, the the film crew just didn't have a clue. A bit what a, the hell a bit like uh, like an X rated 
Punch and Judy or something like that, maybe. Excellent way of putting it. Like, yeah. I couldn't put it. I couldn't put it any better. But it was just it was just the surreal nature. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in a public park and he's got these all these different characters, you know, as I say, X rated X rated Punch and Judy characters and uh, I don't the, the film crew went silent. They yeah. went, you know, I mean that I think we're trying to act cool with it, but mm-hmm. you could see, you could feel the tension. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that really got me up. Like, I was I was loving it, to be honest. <laughs> it's, um... I, mean, I, I, expected, I expected something from him. Yeah, it's, that, yeah. it's, quite, Sorry, um, it's quite interesting what, what you said there uh, as well, Phil, because um, you were saying that all went like bob uh, yeah. coats or jackets. Well... Yeah. Fast forward now, they've dropped the barber jackets. Now they all wear North Face jackets. So, oh, right, right. so yeah. time I times have, have moved on, but the the ethos is still the same. So, uh, it, it it was great that you brought that up. But um, can I ask Phil how how did you and Wavis meet? Did you meet in uh, oh. South uh, South Shields? Yeah, yeah. Uh, quickly, I, I, I attended the. Um, Boys Grammar School in South Shields. Mm-hmm. A, a classmate of mine knew Wavis, knew him very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this this, <laughs> this 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 is pre vis this by the way. Uh-huh. Um my mate turned up at, at, at school with this uh, hand drawn comic called Insane Magazine Weekly. Oh, well, I've never heard of that. And it was a forerunner to the Viz. It had all its own different local characters, etc., etc. So I don't know, I, I'm aware that Wavis knows the uh, the O'Donnell brothers, is it? Uh, yes, but anyway, from the Peter and Saint of Viz comic. Yes, yes, oh. that's right, the hard is. Right? But, but uh, yeah, so anyway, after that, we, we used to be sitting waiting for this comic the mm-hmm. whole school did, to be honest with you, waiting for this comic coming. And I just said to me, mate, oh, I'd, I'd absolutely love to meet this guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll be quick. I don't know if Wavis can remember this. So anyway, we'll, we'll get to an audience with him. And he's in his own house, me and me mate. And uh, we we'll goes into the house, and there he's sitting in the sitting room, welcomes me in. And we we'll sat down, and uh, the couch basically tell her to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay to swear here. Of course, of course, mate, yes. This this uh, is alternative sorry. TV. <laughs> right, well, the, the, we sat on the couch and the couch went, oh, yeah, fuck off, you bastard. That right. hurts. Right. You know, I mean, I mean, we nearly shit myself. I mean, we got up. It was only a tiny little couch. And, and I says, oh, I, you were trying to work out what was going on. Like, I says, oh, I says, you've, you've got a, someone next door and you've got a hole in the wall and there's a, a pipe coming through when they're talking in the couch. You know, he's, no, no, so we moved the couch and it wasn't there. And I saw it's got to be a recording. He says, well, if it's a recording, ask it a question. And I says, what's your name? He says, I haven't got a fucking name. I'm a couch, you daft bastard. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, I was age 14 at the time, you know, and that... That, 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 that was my first ever face-to-face with him, and, age and, 14. We move it on a little bit because the ball stiffers we must mention the ball stiffers, right? Yes, um, yes. People ask me about gigs, right? Wavis was offered loads of gigs because he was quite quite popular, and I turned them all down. Andy Pop, who um, were they reckon they were my management, they had the idea of uh, well, we can dress somebody up as Wavis and they can do the show because they don't know what Wavis looks like, and they actually went and did that. They got a guy all dressed up and they did a show. Uh, it got reviewed by the Record Mirror. I got a big Record Mirror review in the rock press. It, oh, it was very good. And Wavis is Jodie accent. The bloke was from Yorkshire. But anyway, mm-hmm. they thought, well, hey, that worked. How about we can do two or three shows a night? If we can get enough musicians, Wavis can appear in three different towns the same night, you know? Mm. And, 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 and they did that for a while. Um, and I wasn't interested in doing any shows. But prior to that, um, I had a um, loosely called loosely called a band the Ball Stiffers um, <laughs> they played anything but a musical instrument they actually did have a kitchen sink they had a, they played the bull workers um, uh, kitchen sink empty suitcases uh, uh, and such 
and we, we rented a hall in South Shields and um, we, we, we did the tickets, um, which you might have seen. And we invited everybody, all the rival gangs from South Shields. These gangs would kill each other on site, but we invited them all to turn up in the same place. Right. To go and see the ball stiffers. Risky. Which isn't particularly wise, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so we did the show, um, and uh, just before it, 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 it was just going to launch into possibly a riot. I'm going to let Phil talk about what he saw that night. But to get to the admission fees for coming to the show, if I remember correctly, were. Um, a stick of celery or a boiled egg or uh, a piece of paper with sausages wrote on it. There was all these like ridiculous things. And I remember the guy on the door, a slice of bread, right? And I, I remember the guy on the door turning people away because uh, they, were, they had brown bread. He says, no, that's, a, oh. that's counterfeit. It's got to be white bread. And uh, yeah, so uh, what, what was it like for you then, Phil, in the audience? Well... Obviously, being a white ladies lad, I brought my gang along with us, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. weeb. Brought the weeb. White ladies estate, I grew up all they all came. Right. <laughs> and they didn't have a clue what to expect. They didn't know who you were or what the band were, but I told them a little bit, you know. Um, it was just marvellous. I mean, mm. you know, you had, you had Dorman on, and they had, they had those, the, the things around the neck, like, like uh, cinema or charrette, you know, with the ice creams. But you had to put your... Yeah, slice of bread to get in. Mm -hmm. I mean, the second one I went to it was actually a boiled egg with papa written on. Right. I remember that. Yeah. You seem to miss that bit out, the papa written yeah. on, a, on, on an egg. Oh, I remember. Um, I mean, when, I mean, for me, the, the start of the show was just unbelievable. The band came on first dressed in all this weird garb. And as you say, they couldn't play it out apart from... That bulwark, that's that, 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 that kitchen six, this, that, the other. And there was like a build-up for uh, the main man, um, let's say, Wavis, to come on. Mm -hmm. And it all went dark, and I, I still remember there was a build-up of music. I mean, Wavis could actually sing. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd he done, he done the main, the real thing that the rest of the band were imitating. Um, but boom, magnesium flares went up. Yeah, we should have done that. We didn't tell anybody that we could have set the place on fire. <laughs> uh, the magnesium flares went off, and this guy came on. I'll tell you what, I can't remember exactly. I can remember some of it, but he had a, something like a baseball boot on one foot, a flipper on the other foot, a, a pair of pyjama bottoms, a jacket made out of crisp packets. Mm -hmm. ch was it Tudor tatties? Yeah. Crisp yeah, a jacket made out of crisp packets. And the, the piece de resistance for me was he also had a Sibutio floodlight strapped to his head, lit up. Oh, wow, Sibutio. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, that image is just stuck in my mind. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I'm 63 year old now, and that's, oh, glorious. It was absolutely glorious. So, what um, um, what year was this, Phil, when, when you went to see uh, the Boss It must have been about 70. Six four seventy five, right? 76, somewhere around there. Listen, I would have been about 15, 14, 15. Uh -huh. Listen, so I never did shows, you know. We did some most of my stuff, but that was just before I, you know, before I really became aware of this. That was just me finding my way. Uh, but in 2010, um, here in Lincoln, this guy, um, he's a, an oasis, um. Um, tribute band mm -hmm. uh, he does Liam and he's true to form because he always falls out of nowhere and the band always busts up but anyway he was doing a, he was doing a show here at, at Lincoln City football ground in, uh -huh. in Door, indoor which is quite a, quite a, a prestigious venue and he said to me would you like to support us right mm -hmm. well he clearly hadn't a clue what, what he had no idea what he was doing here and um, I thought mm, I might like to do me first and last gig roll into one that might be fun. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. You know. So I um, I decided I'd be um, like a Mustafa Durink, yeah? Yes. He's a Mustafa and he likes his drink, Mustafa Durink. <laughs> and I, I, I'm always fortunate that I get people who always want to work with me, the yeah. musicians, you know, they're, they're admirers. I never have a problem. So I got a band together and uh, this is how it went, you know. I was support act too. 
a band whose audience were coming to see to, to, to rock out to just standard rock music, you know. Mm-hmm. You know it's a tribute band. Anyway, I nailed a mat on a on a, um, a, a, a boogie, a trolley or something, so it looked like a flying carpet. And I got me guys to had this massive introduction booming through the speakers, and I'm all dressed as Mustafa Durink, you know. Mm-hmm. You might see the pictures. Yeah, and I'm going to pop them up. Stage. They pulled me on stage, you know, off my magic carpet. And I had, an, I had a bottle, which for all the world looked like a bottle of whiskey. It didn't look like it had been opened, but it had. And I feel it with cold tea, and it just looked like a bottle of whiskey. Mm-hmm. So I get on stage, and like everybody's, what, the, he's just, what, flying, what, and, and the music's playing through the speakers. And I drank the bottle straight down, you know, mm-hmm. and I, think it, I can see him saying, he's drunk a bottle of whiskey. Straight down the bottle. And so after about three or four minutes, I thought I better start wobbling a little bit. You know? Yeah, to add, to add the effect. Anyway, we did uh, some waiver songs. We did uh, Don't Crush Bees, Mob Shoes Are Awful, The Ballad of the Poker Willies, which I really love. And I remember we ended on Katie Derham's Boom, which I'd more or less released a few years before that. But, you know, as I'd finished the last song, and the audience are getting very unresting here. Um, in fact, one of the guys in the Oasis tribute band didn't smoke, but he started smoking. That's true. He was having a cigarette. You know, it was like, get him off. Get him off. <laughs> All right. Well, by the time it was the last number, which is Katie Derham's bum, I noticed my band had all buggered off and left me one by one. They'd just, just gone. Right. And I left her on stage on my own with a mic doing Katie Derham's bum because I got a backing track. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on my own now, eh? So I, I finished the song and I just thought, I'll just dance. I'll just dance. And I was doing like a, a Mustafa Durin dance. And uh, at one point I was going to stop and say to the audience, what's the matter with you lot? You know, I said, well, I thought I better not. So I gave a signal, back on me flying carpet, Matt, they pulled me away again. Mm-hmm. And there was a, the stage door was open and there was a car revved up, straight in the car, gone whoosh, you know. But uh, people wanted their money back. It was nearly a riot. Wow. And I thought, hey, I could have done this all my life. I really, really enjoyed it. But I only did that show because a guy was going to film it. And I wanted to see, you know, mm-hmm. the first one. Oh, it wasn't filmed? No, and it wasn't filmed. Because oh. the guy who was supposed to film it, he'd left the camera in his dad's house in Scarborough. No. Oh. Right? So, and then, right, um, about two years later, Sky Television gets in touch with me. Sky's got loads of channels, you know, they've got the major ones, they've got yeah. some obscure ones. And this was, uh, these guys said, uh, would you like to come on this, like, all this music type show? Uh, it was called Mindscape Television. So I thought, mm. all right, another chance to get on YouTube this time after mm. we'll start doing it, not happening. Uh, <clears throat> so I got some guys again, they came with me and I trained them up a little bit. We went to Mansfield and we filmed four shows in one day. I did one number for each show. Uh, again, Ballad of the Porter Willies, Don't Crush Bays, whatever. The, the producer said, look, Sky, I'm very, very strict about swearing. Please don't swear on the show. I'm in big trouble. Well, I finished the song. The, my final song was Head But a Demon, which really ends on a big expletive. And I didn't tell him, that, you know, a bit naughty, but I did it. Anyway. All right. So these actually went out on Sky Television at the time, and they were on YouTube for a while. And I thought, great, you could download the whole show, and I'm watching it, thinking, yeah, I could have done this for a living. Yeah. The audience just didn't know what to to do or make of any of it. Audience they didn't get it. Win. I think it was nervous laughter. You know, they really didn't know what to make of it. But then the producer and director had a big bust up with Sky or something like that, and he pulled them all off YouTube. Oh, never. Why am I always thwarted when I want to get, you know, my concerts on YouTube? <laughs> Why do the gods always thwart me, eh? So what, when, you, when you do a concert, can, like, for the audience, so they know what, what they would be seeing, what, it would be you on stage. Would you be playing an instrument? No, never. I, they only, I can just no play instrument. Band. That's about it, really. No, 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 no. So it, it, it would be... Spoken word and... No, I'd sing it. I'd, say, I'd do my songs. I'd write my songs. You would sing, you, right. You would give me a piece of paper and a pen and, and I'll, I'll give me some music and I'll put the lyrics to it. About oh, but, but, but then would you have a backing track? Sometimes on, on stage at the, the Lincoln City Football Ground I had some backing music, yeah, just to beef it up. 
Uh, I didn't when we did the Mindscape stuff, though, no. It's a, it's a little bit kind of scaled back, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Where, where, where were you getting the uh, backing tracks from, uh, like the music and stuff, or what was your well, in again, inspiration for that? I've got a lot of people who are fans and admirers, and, you know, I, I get free studio time, and they'll provide me with it. Right, so, got you. I mean, when I first... I first recorded in 1979, and as it happened, I came to Lincoln, where I'm now living. So when I came to Lincoln in 1998, after a couple of years, I thought, I wonder if the guy who had the four-track studio that I recorded was still around, you know? Mm -hmm. And he is. He's got a massive uh, studio uh, 35 miles out of Lincoln, and uh, they come up from London. The big bands come up from London. It, it's a converted church. And I thought, right, I'm... I'm I'm going to spring it, a, a, a surprise on him. So I found out where he was, and he's always at the music desk, and he's doing his business, and I just came in there and sat next to him. I hadn't seen him for like 35 years, anything like that. And he's doing his business, and I just said, hi, Andy. He's like, bloody way, it's like, I just popped up like yeah. a genie of a lamp. Yeah. That was some moment, that was. And he's still a waver spam, but he used to give me free studio time if oh. I need it. Right, right. Uh, it's not unlimited. It's like, well, you've got like an hour and a half. Get on with it. Get your stuff done and then get out yeah, kind of thing. I to do it in that time. I've got another song coming shortly, and I think The Hard is threatening to do some Christmas song. Oh, that would be absolutely brilliant. He sings out of tune, honestly. He's just like, no, but I, I, this is what I hear anyway. Didn't, didn't, you, didn't you make a song about a year ago? Um, um, Puppy's Dinner. Puppy's Dinner. Puppy's yeah, yeah. Dinner. Yeah. 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 As soon yeah. as I heard it, I mean, I couldn't stop singing it. But well, when I feed, when I feed him, when I, feed him it's, I sing it to him, but it's in it, and I thought, oh, that's catchy, that. Uh -huh. you know, not one for wasting anything. Yeah. You know, like, like when I used to have a so-called friend that would say absurd things, like in an argument, he would say it to somebody, you know, oh, he was arguing with a woman once, and he said, oh, you just think you're a woman because you don't eat fish cakes. And I thought, Wow, I'm having that. I'm going to use that, yeah. And I went away and wrote the song. And it's the same guy who had an argument with somebody else, a bloke mm -hmm. this time, and said, well, uh, well, you shouldn't crush bees to death with the end of your walking stick, which he didn't anyway. I thought, oh, mm. I And I went and wrote the song. Uh, not wasting stuff like that. Where where does the inspiration come from? Where does Weber so shave when he sits down or listens to something? You know what? It's like you know, it's like emails passing through my head all the time. Honestly, uh -huh. emails, uh, characters, catchphrases. Um, I could easily have made a living of it if I wanted to, but I never did. Right? I never wanted to be a celebrity. This is why I turned down six episodes of The Hard for Channel Four because I'd have been a household name, and that's not what I wanted. I, I, I think you're all, that bit out. I, I think you're already. Yeah. 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 What yeah. what was that? Because I've I've completely missed that. I see. I, I missed that bit out. I was actually there when he was offered the the producer in the Marine Park. You know, uh -huh. um, for the tube. Uh -huh. I was there when the producer had said, "Look, come on about the hard," and they were trying to to get him to change his mind. And we says, "Well, we're looking at six half hour series on Channel Four." And uh, he was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, <coughs> you see, you, you could have been a household name, but I think I think the hard the hard was I think the hard was a, a household name. Well, this is why I had to knock, knock it on the head at the time before it snowballed. When when I knocked him on the head, he felt no. But uh, you know, I had to, I had to say that's it because people were dragging me into stardom and fame which I, I don't want to do that I just want to have a bit of fun yeah. and that's what I've always done I've never set out to be famous and it's hard once you want you to be famous um, because you get the offers and mm. I had to refuse them and still do I get some funny little offers occasionally oh would you like to do this would you yeah. like to do that yeah and of course just like that. I like to pop up when I feel like it like, like you know you put some toast in your toast and it pops up you're on terms <laughs> Just to show that I'm still alive and well, because lots of people think I'm either dead or in prison. You know, there was one guy in 1995 on Beatles Hot Shots, ripped the heart off. Because uh, he thought, well, you know, who's going to say anything? And I took legal action about that. Really? So, well, yeah, I took legal action. Um, I was, uh, Beatles Hot Shots was on the telly on a Saturday night, and I was reading something, and on the telly it's, I'm that hard, blah, blah, blah. Hey, what am I doing? And he's going on headbutt and stuff, right? Oh, right. Only, Beatles says you get 
send us a funny clip and we put it on, 250 pound, right? So this happened and I thought, oh, all right, you know, okay. But he was on the next week as well. Mm. And you only spoke on the once. And he's on the next week as well. This, this guy calling himself hard as nails. Starting to piss you off. So I went to uh, solicitors and all this business, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I got in touch with London Weekend Television. They wouldn't give me the name of the guy to serve a writ on him. Uh, uh, and my barrister needed um, video footage, right? And London Weekend Television wouldn't hand it over. Oh, right. Uh, and it, it kind of fizzled out there, but it was a big elaborate setup because uh, in, he was on five bloody weeks. He made a fortune out of my character, and it was just to, in the final episode to promote Silverstone Racing or something. It was oh. well contrived and thought out. Oh, it was like a, a marketing plan. Yeah, yeah, it was a big scam. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, I wasn't impressed. You can't, you can't, you can't mess with another man's creativity. You can't. I'm just gonna have a, another week. Do you know what I mean? Also, I'd like to I'd like to uh, to touch on the first the first ever UK hip hop record. I'm 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 intrigued with this because I'm 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 a big fan of hip hop. I think one of the first. You think they nick and hold Whoa. me here? You think there's a prison that can keep me here? Me the heart? Do you know who I am? Eh? I'm That's the heart. You stare at me, you skinny, funny, skinny you now, say, hey, you... The hard, the hard, I want to ask you something. You're not weird, whatever. I'm not bloody hard. You're in my heart, man. See, so, you're bloody not... That's a mess with me. And if you, and if you get hit with me, I'll feel no... I'll feel no... No, 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 I'll feel no, no, no. <laughs> the hard's destroyed another interview. Phil, Phil, are you still there? <laughs> Hello, is anybody there? Well, that was absolutely great. The hard made another appearance. He keeps, he must be like watching what we're doing, but it's it's destroyed another way of his interview. But um. That's it, man. That 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 was the the UK's first alternative surrealist comedian with his good friend Phil the Gap, and we briefly talked about the ball stiffers. May, maybe we could have we chatted about the ball stiffers a bit more. I think time was running a bit low, and uh, the hard was was out there ready. I want to thank everyone for joining. Well, the hard, obviously. Thanks for making a second appearance. Wavis, thanks so much, mate. Always welcome on the channel. It's always great to chat to you. And fill the gap. First time we've met. I think all, all of will be chatting chatting again. And if you if you're ever in Newcastle, mate, give give uh, give us a shout. It's absolutely great to meet you all again, so peace out. Thanks man. Well, now, 